Okay, well, let's uh, dive in. And this is an interactive webinar. We are live. And so if you have questions, type them into the Q&A box down below and we'll attempt to get to them. Mark, if you want to share your screen and we will get a preview of the apparel report that you have so kindly put together for us. Wonderful. Over okay. to you, Mark. All right, great. Um, yeah, well, John, so as you said, it's a creative and, and um, funny title, but this is actually, you know, one of those um, uh, uh, areas where synthetic biology is a particularly good match. So even though, you know, synthetic biology, when you talk about it as wetware, that's a bit of an allusion to the digital um, uh, analogies with, uh, with biology, um, sportswear and uh, uh, really sportswear and food, the, the um, application we talked about most recently, just a few weeks ago, are things where they've traditionally been sourced from biology. Uh, there's, uh, you know, a lot that we eat, obviously, that most of that is, is living. Um, and a lot of things that we've worn traditionally are also, um, came from biology, but more recently, obviously we've diverged from that. Um, we, uh, do still grow cotton and, and animals and things like that for, for wearing, but we have a lot of synthetic fibers. So the potential of synthetic biology, again, a lot like the potential in food is to really take the best of traditional materials and the best of very new materials that we can program um, almost to, with a you know, near software-like precision, or at least we'd like to, to get there someday, um, is really the big potential. So yeah, with that, um, why don't we dive in? So uh, I think as everybody knows, the point of these webinars is really to help people who work in the synthetic biology field understand an industry a little bit better and people who work in that industry understand synthetic biology better. And we start out with uh, an overview of the industry, the challenges it faces and things like that. So that if you have spent most of your time in a lab, hopefully this will help you connect the dots between what you're working on and what the industry needs. Um, so the industry globally is a, a, a very large industry. It's two to $3 trillion a year that uh, humans spend on apparel and accessories. Uh, that would be things like purses and bags and shoes and, and stuff like that. Um, it's growing at about 4% a year, um, which is uh, not really high growth when we think about like a booming market, but that masks some interesting dynamics going on. Um, and that is that uh, the overall market is growing in quantity, but prices of, of the things that we buy are coming down. Um, and also a lot of the growth is, is coming in areas like organic cotton, for example, um, where the, uh, the size of the market is growing by leaps and bounds uh, very quickly, but it's from a very, very small base. So 240 million out of a $3 trillion market, as you can tell, is not very much, but um, that still could be a lot of interest for a company that is currently making things you know, in grams and kilograms, uh, not quite yet tons. So, um, so that's one thing, just the size and the fact that it's very uh, uh, divided up into lots of different segments. Um, and that's really important too in, uh, in clothing. So there are very few products uh, that have the variety that clothing does. In other words, the variety of kinds of things. Um, almost everything else, if you wanna buy, um, for example, milk or you wanna buy a computer or something like that, you have thousands, tens of thousands, even millions of units that are effectively identical. Whereas with clothing, there are certain things that are like that, white t-shirts and so on and so forth. But the vast majority of uh, what we buy and what really drives the industry is very different. Um, so even a, you know, a blue t-shirt from say Uniqlo uh, is gonna be produced in several different sizes. Um, and then you get into more specific fashion where you know, a designer is only gonna be doing say tens of thousands of a certain uh, size uh, garment. Um, Part of that's because our bodies are different sizes, uh, sometimes based on gender, sometimes based on age. Um, there are different activities that we can that we wear clothing for almost all of our activities, uh, sports and streetwear and things like that. Um, and so this basically means that uh, that flexibility in manufacturing is really key. Uh, you design something, uh, let's say a shoe or a shirt, but then you have to be able to basically manufacture it in all kinds of sizes, colors, shapes, and, and everything else. Um, and to give you an example of how these things all break down, if you look at golf, just golf wear, uh, so people, almost everybody wears clothes when they're golfing. Um, 
uh, it's a six billion dollar market in total. So even if you were just addressing the golf market, you'd have a pretty big market to go after. Um, and that breaks down to a lot of clothes, a little bit of uh, uh, shoes, and a little slice of accessories. Um, you could also break this down by again uh, things like you know style and age and gender and a bunch of other segments. So. If you're looking to enter the market, basically what you need to do is find some place where the quantities, the purchasing quantities are actually large. So for synthetic biology, that's a lot of raw materials um, and upstream things, but it's also some midstream and downstream things. So the next thing I wanted to do is look at the supply chain and key companies. Uh, anything you wanted to say about that, John, before I move on? Um, no, I was interested in, the, in the, what you said about the prices falling, but uh, please continue. Yeah, well, um, I'll, I'll get into this actually throughout because it's one of the, the main drivers of what's going on in, in fashion and something that um, everybody needs to be aware of. Even if you're not developing something, you could sell into the fashion market it's about how we, you know, how we buy clothes and how we can do that more sustainably. Um, because if you look at the key challenges uh, in synthetic bio, or sorry, in the clothing industry, not having anything to do with synthetic biology yet, but just what's the industry trying to deal with? These are actually very similar to the challenges that I mentioned uh, on our last webinar around clothing. Um, so the core thing is innovation. You've got to keep innovating, coming up with new products and services, and and you know doing things in a way that appeals to customers who've seen just about everything. Um, but then around that core of innovation, you've got uh, the economics and specifically in clothing, the cost of materials and labor um, are, as, even though we think about it as being pretty low, um, that's still one of the major drivers of the, uh, the item itself. Um, basically getting things, again, cotton or synthetic materials, turn those into um, uh, to, to garments um, has been very labor intensive. And that's because automation is really difficult in textiles. Um, it's not like in, say, auto parts where you are welding hard things that have a very well-defined shape and, and placement. Uh, textiles are very floppy. Uh, there's really no easy way to make uh, textile robots work. So that's why there's still a lot of, um, of labor. Uh, also, the different sizes and shapes that I alluded to before um, are actually much easier for humans to do than robots uh, can do right now. Um, the uh, other thing is you have very long supply chains. So because you're trying to develop or pr rather produce your product uh, at, uh, in a place where labor costs are low, that tends to be developing uh, countries. But you want to sell that in places where the, uh, the market is big and where people will spend a lot on those garments. So that tends to be more developed countries. So that means that you might have six months between starting to manufacture something and it actually showing up in stores. So um, that's a lot harder now because our seasons are shorter. And I don't mean the, the climate seasons, but the fashion seasons. So I mentioned fast, fast fashion before. It used to be that you had a summer collection and a winter collection, or maybe four throughout the year. Um, and a lot of companies like you know Zara and The Gap and H&M, they're going to 10, 20 uh, seasons a year. In other words, they're producing things constantly. And they have to know pretty far in advance what's going to be selling. Um, so the seasons are shorter, the supply chains are still long, and copycats arise uh, a lot faster too. So there are people that basically make a living just selling um, uh, copies of the stuff that you'd find in um, in those those stores, and they themselves are copies of things that you find on you know high expensive fashion runways. Um, one of the big challenges, though, and this doesn't really have much to do with e-commerce, or sorry, with synthetic biology, but it does impact how synthetic biology can help the industry, is uh, the fact that retail, e-commerce, clothes as a service, like Stitch Fix and things like that, basically mean that our channels to market are really getting different. And so that puts a lot of pressure on the previous things to basically get cooler clothes to market faster. And if there'd be a way to move production closer to where uh, consumption is happening, um, that would be a really good way to do that. So to the extent that synthetic biology can provide materials at the proper scale in markets where things are being produced and in a way that the manufacturing economics are different, then that could solve a lot of problems. Um, environmental health and safety, these are actually pretty standard um, in terms of uh, you know, how, how companies and industries deal with this, but the, the clothing industry has kind of a black eye about this right now because um, they're constantly being, you know, finding out that uh, worker health is not being attended to, uh, worker safety um, is uh, very poor, um, and then the environmental consequences of things like water use, CO2 output, and so on are really, really high. So um, 
there's a, a bit of a debate going on about how much the environmental catastrophe that clothing represents uh, is overblown or not. Um, it, it is a very, very high impact. Nobody would argue with that. But the question is, is the industry reacting maybe even too much uh, to that? It's hard to make that argument in today's, you know, pun, no pun intended, today's climate that you're not doing enough for the environment. But, um, but that's the case. At any rate, they're in dire need of solutions there. Um, on ethics, uh, so the treatment of animals, you know, leather and, and um, uh, horn, uh, ivory, things like that, those are all, you know, huge ethical issues. Um, workers' conditions, how workers are treated, uh, how they're paid and so on is a big issue. And then there's the topic of greenwashing. A lot of uh, companies in fashion trying to sort of appear to be green or appear to be doing things ethically, but, um, but actually aren't. So all those constraints, that's just starters. Then you actually have to make products that people want to buy. Um, and so uh, some of the main drivers of innovation are new and high performance materials. So you uh, uh, probably have some things made with Gore-Tex, so really you know, breathable, light, strong materials. Um, recently, hyper-reflective materials have gotten really interesting. So uh, these are the reflective materials you see like on, on jogging outfits and stuff like that that really light up when a, a car's headlights hit them. Um, so that's one constant area for uh, for interest. The the short supply chain, or sorry, short seasons and, and long supply chains I mentioned earlier have led to a lot of interest in new types of design um, abilities. So when I say cut and color, by that I mean not things that are intrinsic to the material, but basically how a, a garment is shaped. Is it loose or baggy? Is it tight or is it uh, reflective? You know, all these different types of properties that they get not just from the material, but from how it's actually designed um, to be sewn together or attached. Um, and then there's a lot of innovation, what I would call extended responsibility. So this is sort of the counter to greenwashing, um, but it basically means looking at the, um, at the garment as something more than just uh, an object that somebody wears, but something that's part of a, a social trend, like the, um, if you remember the, the red uh, trend that you saw in a lot of consumer products a few years ago that was uh, meant to support um, AIDS research. Uh, so basically looking at the garment as something that credibly fits in with a bigger purpose uh, is also a way that um, uh, the clothing manufacturers are trying to innovate today. So again, any questions or comments on this before we get back into that supply chain? Um, yeah, we have a question from Ganendra. Um, mm -hmm. And Ganendra wants to know if there are any recent innovations in biomaterials to make commodities like shoes, which are biodegraded for. For example, synthetically mm. produced material. Yeah, um, there. So biodegradable is just one way to recycle uh, uh, any material, but but clothing in particular. So, um, for example, Adidas made some shoes a few years ago using a variant of spider silk, and there's a special enzyme that you can use to to biodegrade those. Um, as we'll get into in a little, uh, just a slide or two actually, the waste stream coming out of uh, clothing is a huge opportunity because right now um, it's just uh, all over the map. <laughs> so even in a, let's say, a, you know, very environmentally um, aware and uh, progressive region like Europe, you find uh, recycling rates on clothing that span from basically nothing to to very very high you know 60 70 percent so a lot of that has to do with customer awareness um, with the ability of a local uh, say recycling facility to actually take those things so you might have the the adidas shoes but if you don't know a place where you can recycle them and have them you know eaten up by enzymes as opposed to you know uh, ground up in, in a grinder uh, a shredder then it doesn't help that much so Big question there on recycling. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, moving on, as I said, uh, looking at the supply chain the, at the top here, this is a you know a very high level supply chain view. Um, you've got raw materials, cotton, and animal materials, and, and so on that that get processed into textiles, sheets, um, uh, foams, and things like that that uh, then get manufactured, assembled into um, the, the garment, the shoe, the, the accessory. Uh, that's a really um, fragmented market. Um, it's, there are thousands of small suppliers and manufacturers uh, all over the world that are doing this. 
Um, there are a few large suppliers in chemicals and materials. So um, Dow DuPont, BASF, uh, these chemical manufacturers are making you know, polyurethanes and other types of things that go into, uh, uh, into garments. Um, but that, the reason I've highlighted it is because that's really where we typically think of synthetic biology as playing. Um, it's very much about materials, how you bring those materials together and how you, you know, grow larger structures or, or uh, integrate with uh, manufacturing. Uh, the next two steps that are very light, wholesale distribution and retail distribution, are faded because these are typically not things that we think of as a synthetic biology market. Um, but in fact, this is actually where you need to be paying attention um, because these companies, as you look at them, are not only a very, very large multi-billion dollar companies in, in 2018, um, they're very global, they're all over the place. Um, and they are the ones that basically set the strategies. So uh, if you want to, uh, introduce a new material or if you want to improve worker safety or you want to improve the economics of the industry, these are really the only companies that have the ability to put pressure upstream or downstream to actually make that happen. And the reason there's two categories here, apparel and accessories and then apparel retailers, is they have slightly different business models that sometimes overlap and sometimes don't. So Nike, for example, makes shoes that don't, they don't only sell in Nike stores. Um, Zara makes clothes that they only sell in their stores and they don't sell any other clothes in their stores. TJ Maxx doesn't sell, doesn't make anything they sell. They only sell other people's brands. And um, you can kind of see that there's not a perfect match basically between the apparel and accessories uh, and then the apparel retailers. So if you're looking to who do I go to get into the design for the next shoe or the, you know, uh, the next coat or something like that, you really have to kind of, um, uh, play it by ear a little bit on the retailer side, a bit on the apparel and accessories side, almost everybody there is going to be interested in something that a synthetic biology materials manufacturing company or dye maker or other thing has to offer. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Great. Okay. It's and amazing. then finally, just to see the, 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 the size of some of these and particularly the three in China that you've got on the left. Um, yeah. Yeah, and those are growing. So Anta Sports is, you know, they basically want to be like a Nike or, or Adidas uh, of China. Um, so they're, you know, investing in their own stores. They're investing in, you know, branding and, and um, sponsoring uh, star athletes and things like that. So, yeah, China for many, many reasons is important to watch. Right. And just to remind everybody, this is a live webinar. If you do have questions, just type them in the Q&A box and we'll ask them to mark. Okay, and then um, we actually on the previous slide talked about waste and, and recovering and recycling materials. So uh, this is a also a very fragmented um, process right now. So basically most, uh, if not all, recycling and, and waste handling is done locally. So every town, every city, every region has its own systems, its own suppliers and vendors, and in some cases its own rules and policies. Um, and so this is an area that is important to watch, but that also has some applicability in synthetic biology, uh, just because of the ability as, as the, um, the uh, person asking the question, saying, well, what about materials that are you know, biodegradable, uh, also biosource materials are a little bit different. So to dive into that, um, uh, this chart basically shows that it's not just at the end of the supply chain, actually all throughout the supply chain and clothing, uh, there are opportunities to take care of waste and synthetic biology has a really good um, ability to do that. So I'm actually going to start with what we just ended. So start on the right and then move back upstream. Um, if you look at the amount of clothing that gets thrown into uh, a landfill or um, is incinerated, that's the vast majority. That's like a, more than 75% of all clothing basically ends up there as just garbage. So whatever materials it has that could be recycled or reused in a, a useful way, almost all of that gets just thrown away. Um, so that's kind of atrocious waste. There is some reuse and some recycling, but that only accounts for about 18% of the, the clothing that, that gets you know, past its, you know, its end of life. Then we look at clothing in use, and this is also a really huge um, and very interesting uh, uh, situation it's almost unprecedented i can think of very little you know very few other products that that we we consume in this way um so when you buy something you're gonna wear it you can only wear one thing at a time so generally uh you don't um 
uh, you don't buy clothing because it's it's just what you need to wear. You don't buy, say, five shirts because you wash every five days. Most of us have many, many, many more items than we actually use. Um, and uh, some studies have looked at something like 30% of the items hanging in a typical European closet haven't been used in a year. 30%. Um, and then, you know, clothing that actually does get used, it maybe gets used for a year or so. And, um, and basically, it's, it, this, at least, uh, this study found that 54% um, uh, uh, of the clothing is basically um, uh, gone for the next year. So we have a lot of turnover in clothing, but we also have like huge, you know, uh, inventory, if you will, that uh, we keep uh, stored up for no, apparently no good reason. And we end up throwing it out before, almost all of it out before it's actually worn out. Um, then upstream, again, this is where we usually think of waste in the clothing, uh, clothing industry. When the raw materials get, you know, processed and manufactured, generally they come in in huge square sheets. Nothing we wear is really that square. So there's all these trimmings and tailings. Uh, just you know, pieces that basically don't fit in the final garment but are too small to be reused. That's about 35% of the raw materials end up going straight into the trash before they've even been um, uh, uh, you know, turned into clothing that we use. So, so there's a lot of opportunities here to recover these, uh, these things. And if they could be turned into some kind of productive use, Again, it's not all, say, cotton and, and leather and, and things that would be biodegradable. Um, there are synthetic fibers, microplastics. If we can replace those, that's also a big benefit. But there's tons of opportunity just looking at the garbage in synthetic, or sorry, in the, so the uh, apparel supply chain. Okay, so. Um, if we say, uh, go back and like, what are some of the specific companies within synthetic biology, some of the startups and, and other uh, companies that address these needs? Um, the, again, going back to that, that picture that I showed before, um, growing materials, uh, traditional materials more sustainably, either you know, on the level of agriculture or by modifying those materials, um, uh, if they're plants or by um, you know, uh, doing lab grown alternatives to leather is one big area. Uh, inventing completely novel, like high performance materials. We see this, for example, with uh, spider silk. We don't uh, wear spider silk ever because there's no way to grow spiders in uh, enough density to, to, to grow, to get silk industrially because they eat each other. Uh, silkworms don't, um, but it's a great material. Uh, we have a lot of environmentally or ethically dubious materials and processes that we can replace. Um, this again might be uh, endangered species, which people still, um, you know, hunt for just for wearing or for decoration. Uh, and then we've got new manufacturing processes. So um, the ability to grow foams, for example, from uh, 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 like essentially the way we grow mushrooms, growing uh, the uh, bio-based materials that can uh, take the take the place of, of ones that we would harvest or or uh, grow otherwise. Um, and then, as we just mentioned, uh, new materials and processes that can support better waste conversion. So looking at some of these, these types of benefits, um, I uh, pulled together a list of some of the top companies in these areas that you see at the bottom. So leather, silk, and other fibers, dyes, things you'd find kind of upstream. Um, adhesives, fasteners, and features uh, that you'd find midstream in, in actual manufacturing. And then waste treatment downstream. Um, I'm not going to go into waste treatment uh, on this, uh, this conversation, but we'll go into the other areas. So leather is one of these uh, topics that's gotten a lot of hype um, because, you know, most of us really like leather. But when you think about where it comes from, especially if you're in the fashion industry and a lot of people in the fashion industry tend to also be, you know, um, uh, want to at least, you know, pr ex ex express or espouse progressive values. Um, the fact that so many animals are killed for, for skin and fur uh, is uh, difficult to reconcile. So um, replacing these whole animal uh, leathers with lab-grown equivalents, like these um, are from ZOA, which has just been a, a project done by Modern Meadow. By the way, the, the bold on the table on the, uh, the right means this is the picture is sourced from them. Um, uh, is, is one example. So you can just see that, you know, the colors and the varieties of textures that you can get and uh, this is really only the beginning. So there's a lot more innovation to come out of that. Um, and that's where we see this, uh, you know, it's possible to improve leather and its properties, uh, even grow exotic species or make up 
uh, new, you know, new types of materials that we haven't seen before from uh, animals found in nature. So there's a lot of potential in leather and excitement about that. Um, silken fibers. Uh, this is a, a picture of a, a tennis suit um, developed uh, with Adidas and Stella McCartney using materials from bolt threads. Um, silk is already a high performance material. It's very lightweight, strong. We like the way it feels. Um, but spider silk, like I said, has some additional properties. We just can't get spiders to grow it in, uh, in industrial quantities. But by basically using um, synthetic biology, microfluidics, and other techniques, a lot of companies are now trying to do that. Um, there are a lot of other fibers that we also wear, like wool and cotton. Um, so the um, so CSIRO, CSIRO in uh, Australia is, uh, as you probably all know, a big research university uh, institution that does um, uh, uh, a lot of really groundbreaking and, and long-term things. And they've been looking at um, developing cotton, um, you know, modifying cotton basically to provide new types of properties that it wouldn't get in its natural form. Um, then we have these things that we think of as pretty small, and it, it, in terms of the sort of overall mass of the uh, you know clothing articles, they are, but they have a lot of importance. Um, and so dyes, for example, there's several companies that are working on um, more sustainable dyes for making jeans and other types of color, uh, blue, you know, blue and other types of colors that we, we use for clothing. This cuts down on the water use, and it also gives us again access to more sustainable sources of, uh, of these dyes. Um, adhesives and foams. Now, th there's a lot going on in this space, but one uh, company to point out is the Covative. Uh, they do a lot of different things, as you know. Um, and uh, in fact, they're working with uh, Bolt on a, a sort of a leather alternative, but um, the ability to, again, grow materials that can be used to uh, uh, stick parts of a garment together um, or, or uh, provide padding and shape. Um, are good. Adhesives are really interesting. You might be thinking, well, what, what are adhesives doing in clothing? But um, there are a lot of high-performance materials that are looking at uh, using adhesives, glue, essentially, instead of stitching, um, because it could potentially last longer. It's easier to manufacture. It uh, basically means you can use thinner materials uh, that don't have to basically hold a thread to stay together. Um, so that's a different area of, of innovation in, uh, in textiles and, and uh, apparel. And then finally, fasteners and features. By that, I mean things like uh, buttons, zippers, snaps, um, other sort of decorative things that uh, would normally be made from horn, for example, or from shells that uh, aren't always sustainably sourced. So Pembient and uh, Serotatech uh, are both working on developing uh, alternatives to that to those, those hard materials. Um, and the University of Oxford, they're working on silk, as you can see from the, uh, uh, from the name of this particular group, um, but they're also working on ivory, or they have been working on ivory. So even things that you know, are uh, potentially coming from endangered species, we could uh, hopefully uh, change, you know, shift the market to something that's a lot more sustainable. So that's the you know kind of a, a summary of the the types of materials that are coming out of synthetic biology that could uh, can help the fashion industry. Um, John, do you have any other comments or questions, or if anybody in the audience come in with anything? I do not. Thank you very much, Mark. Very interesting okay. to see this. Um, okay. So this ends. Oh, we do oh, have a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, we have another question from Ganendra. Yeah. What do you think about upcoming Symbio foundries and where do they stand for large scale biomanufacturing in time frame compared to global silicon foundry? Oh, well, they're, yeah, really different um, processes. And so the name, uh, you know, bio foundries definitely encapsulates the idea. But you know, if you have to remember how many decades and how many billions and billions of dollars it took to scale up silicon foundries. Um, biology has the right idea that we need that sort of a, a foundation but um, I think the last let's say 10 or 10 or so years of scaling up processes that um, uh, like for you know bio-based fuels bio-based chemicals um, we've learned a lot in that process but I think one of the thing the big thing we've learned is that we still have a long way to go um, the uh, the strategy that you've seen a lot of uh, companies in synthetic biology pursue, which is starting with um, small volume, high value materials, and then moving into things like uh, you know lower lower value, higher volume uh, materials, is 
really the the best way to ensure your survival. So this was a mistake I think we saw with a lot of you know people going straight to biofuels. Um, that was done uh, you know around say 2005 2010 when fuel prices were high. People were just beginning to get very concerned about global warming, and nobody really thought about the fact that that's a fuel is literally cheaper than water, and you have to make make it in gargantuan quantities to have any real impact on those two problems. Whereas really high value, small volume materials like pharmaceuticals, food ingredients, and clothing pieces and parts um, are actually very um, much better suited to the economics of, of uh, 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 bio foundries. So are you I think that it's a good fuel, place. Fuel is cheaper than water? Yeah, think about, you know, a gallon of, uh, uh, if you buy a gallon of bottled water at the store, it's not going to cost you three or $4. That's even California prices. Go to the rest of the country, it's two or three. So, wow. It's hard to make, hard to make anything cheaper than water if you need water for it. So, yeah, True. but clothing isn't cheaper than water. So start here with, start with this. Um, I did want to end on some, uh, some kind of like what happens next, because a lot of these, um, I thought it was going to be embarrassing photos of me at Burning Man. <laughs> that's, that's a, <laughs> that would be a webinar in and of itself, John, we're going to do that. Um, or maybe at beta space. Uh, yes. well, I did want to end with actually some Burning Man types of things. So one of the, um, uh, when I, when I say that, I mean, Burning Man is, uh, about, um, getting really beyond anybody's comfort zone. And there are a lot of projects, I would call them, you know, art projects or early experiments in synthetic biology today, but that's really how a lot of stuff starts. You can look at the, you know, um, uh, you know definitely in any digital industry, a lot of the early applications are very artistic and we're not really sure what they're good for, virtual reality and so on. Um, but uh, in, um, uh, in synthetic biology, these areas where people are really pushing the edge, you know, trying to, or at least saying they're going to grow leather jackets out of human skin and, and things like that. Um, but some of the really interesting ones that I, I think are closer to market and um, would have a broader appeal. One is removable tattoos. So um, there's a company, actually a few companies in this space uh, uh, where basically they're looking at the mechanism that by which tattoos work. Uh, you inject um, pigment into the skin and then macrophages from your immune system come and gobble up those those uh, molecules, but those dye molecules are too big for them to effectively break down. So they just sit there and that's how tattoos work. So these companies are basically coming in with uh, materials and um, uh, love it. drugs basically that break those macrophages up and then ideally break up the pigments as well that uh, wow. so it can be yeah, erased. I want one of but, those. Yeah, I would expect to see that next year at Symbio Beta. Um, on maybe on your face, Something yeah, like a big one, very visible. Sure, it's it's removable. Yeah. Um, uh, other things are looking at, you know, in extinct uh, animals and plants or invented animals and plants, using those to make, you know, let's say a, a mammoth for a jacket. That that's what you're going to wear at Burning Man next year, um, uh, or, or actual living materials. So these are things that they might be, um, you know, algae and tubes. They might be plants that are actually still growing while they're on your body. Um, but living materials as a, a new, you know, option in, in clothing and fashion. It's one of the areas, basically, one of the industries where you can experiment almost as much as your imagine will take you, imagination will take you, and somebody's going to want that just because it is, again, so far out there. So, anyway, hopefully that's been a, a, a interesting and useful uh, overview for everybody. And if we do have some more questions, we've got some time for that. Sure. Um, and just tell me which companies are working on removable tattoos, you know? Yeah. Ephemeral is one um, there. And then there's a, uh, the other two I'm blanking on their names, but they are in the report that we'll be coming out with uh, soon. So people can find out there. Fantastic. And we have time just for one last question from Ravi. who says most attempts of Symbio are now in high value, low volume products. For example, leather companies, which are targeting mm -hmm. luxury goods. When will these, right products reach the mainstream um so the there are a couple of different things that are holding back synthetic biology for large-scale production um, some of it is just the difficulty of getting repeatable uh, results so some of it's still very much a science experiment um, but then there are other things that are uh, 
more about uh, regulation. So if you want to have GM cotton, for example, you're going to need large fields um, and, and there is GM cotton, but you have to basically go through some processes to get that approved. And then you've got to basically find people that are uh, happy with the economics of that. Um, but that said, as we just went through, there actually are a lot of companies that are producing things at, at roughly the scale that, you know, fashion can start using. Um, fashion is, you know, very, it is the, the, the reason we call it fashion is because it is uh, these short-lived things that we, you know, we, we pick up on trends and fashions and so on. So um, you start with a number of, you know, very innovative people that uh, want to look different from everybody else. The next wave wants to copy those people. The third wave wants to copy the people that copied them. And so it does take time for these things to diffuse out into the marketplace. Um, and uh, it, it um, so at, at some point in the not too distant future, I'm sure that, you know, things like spider silk and Zoa leather and so on are going to be very commonplace. Uh, we, uh, just, it's just natural that basically it takes a little time for the market to, to know about them and want them. So I apologize, Mark, are you able to hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. You can still hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Apologies. I can't actually hear you. A call came into my phone and uh, okay. it's not uh, letting me hear you right now. But uh, we were at the end of the webinar, so uh, I just wanted to thank you again for joining us. A fantastic overview of the apparel industry and the impacts of synthetic biology in it. Thank you all for joining us and this, this uh, webinar will be available online afterwards as well. So we will see you again soon. And if you're not already coming to Symbi Beta, then we look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks uh, at Symbi Beta. You can sign up at symbiobeta.com and there's plenty of uh, materials and chemicals companies coming to look at how we can biofabricate the future. Thanks again for joining us and thank you, Mark. Okay.